All right, we're starting uh, lecture eight, chapter eight here in your book. Uh, we're gonna be over AC circuits. All right, so some of the topics we're gonna cover here is uh, sine, sine waveforms, okay, or sinusoidal waveforms. So we can uh, talk about sine and cosine a little bit and leading and lagging current. You know, how uh, do the voltage and current values change? Uh, how we take angle measurements, uh, degrees and radians, and being able to go back and forth where they come from, and talk about how an alternator uh, generates electricity or how AC motors work. And then we're gonna learn how to read uh, what different sine or sine waves or sinusoidal waveforms, how to read those uh, off oscilloscope. All right, so what is AC, right? Alternating current, all right? That's the same stuff that when we plug in our vacuum cleaner in our house, or any time that we plug into the outlets in our house, all right, we're using AC voltage and AC current. And this is what it looks like as it transmits, okay? So on the right-hand side, all right, we got a generator that's going around, okay? And AC uses slip rings versus, remember, the DC used the commutator and brushes. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a little bit different with AC, but not 100% different, okay? But what we're really doing is, as that rotates around, we're creating electron flow. And we're gonna get into this sinusoidal development, but that's really what we're doing is following this wavelength. All right, so it continuously varies in magnitude. All right, so what, what are we talking about with magnitude, all right? It's the, you know, we have a top part of the wave and a bottom part of the wave, and it's oscillating between negative and positive. We're gonna get more in depth into that, but that's really kind of what we're talking about. Uh, the magnitude generally is either the voltage or the current. It kind of just depends on what we're talking about. And it periodically reverses polarity. So when we're looking at the oscillating piece here on the left-hand side, that's the yellow underneath the, uh, the waveform, and then the white, okay? So yellow's positive here, white's negative, as you see it as it transmits. Uh, and goes back and forth. But this is essentially, you know, how we generate uh, sinusoidal voltages. So the symbol for us, okay, is a circle with a tilde in it. And that should make sense now, right? Because we've used a multimeter, right? And I've told you, hey, if we're reading AC voltage, it's the one with the tilde. Because it's the tilde looks like a sine wave to us, so that we know that it's a sinusoidal waveform, or it's an alternating waveform, or alternating current, alternating voltage. So this one should really make sense, all right? Remember the DC voltage had four bars, too long and too short. So we gotta just really make sure that we understand the difference uh, between the two. All right, so let's break down a sinusoidal waveform. So we have the positive maximum and the negative maximum. So remember when we talked before about the magnitude a couple slides ago? This is really what we're talking about, the magnitude of the waveform, the highest voltage or current it gets and the lowest voltage or lowest current it gets. What I want you to understand though is it's not, it's not a negative voltage per se. The direction is negative. That's really what I want you to hone us in. There's no such thing as like negative 12 volts. It's the polarity. The direction is the opposite of the electrons. So remember when we talked about electron flow, electrons would, um, when we uh, talked about electron theory in that outer shell, that valence electron that was just sitting there and our good conductors had like one uh, electron in that outer shell that wanted to escape. Well, remember when those electrons bounce back and forth off of each other. They're, they're going forward for a little bit and then backwards for a little bit. Forward and backward, forward and backward. That's really what we're seeing here with the waveform. When the electron's moving forward, we're getting that positive maximum. When the electron's moving backward, we're getting that negative maximum. That's all it really is, is direction uh, as the electrons flow, all right? And the really, we call sine waves, okay? Because that's the function shape. They are a sinusoidal waveform. And there's a couple, sine and cosine are the main ones, okay? A repeating waveform that's continuous and never ending, right? Unless you unplug or plug into it, that waveform is gonna go on forever. That's, this is the main reason why in electricity we have power lines that go all across the country, or right, or you put them underground. They are called transmission lines, but what are we transmitting? We're transmitting the different phases of electricity through those wires in a sinusoidal waveform. All right, so this is really the difference between why we have AC and DC, all right? DC is direct current. If you notice, everything that we use, like electronically, is all DC. So your computer, your laptop, your cell phone, all right, everything that's portable is DC. DC works really well when it doesn't have to travel long distances. 
AC works phenomenal when it has to travel long distances. So that's why when we like transmit to your neighborhood or to your houses or across the country or from you know, dams where we're generating electricity out to substations that go out to homes, we can transmit AC a long ways and we cannot transmit DC a long ways. So even when your cell phone communicates, all right, everything that you're doing on your cell phone is digital and then when it actually sends the signal out, it converts it back to analog and sends it in a sine wave form to the cell tower and all the towers transmit back and forth using sinusoidal waves, not DC waves that are direct current, okay? DC works really good locally, AC works good on a long distance, and then we don't need AC necessarily locally, unless we're running some motors or things like that that really need a higher end voltage. Uh, you're not gonna get like a 480 volt DC circuit, all right? It just doesn't work that way. But that kind of hopefully gives you a little bit of background. I mean, the main background between this was like between Tesla and Edison, all right? Edison wanted to make everything DC, Tesla wanted to make things um, AC so that he could transmit. And there was, you know, Tesla worked for Edison, but there's a lot of good history between them, but they ended up hating each other. And there was a big war, uh, not war, but, uh, you know, um, Edison wouldn't give Tesla his patents and things like that. So Tesla did a lot of great things and is mainly known for the AC transmission. And uh, Edison was always a DC guy. So the two often butt heads. Uh, but we ended up using uh, both of their methods in our real world here, right? Well, not that they weren't in the real world, but in what we use and how we, uh, our demands for electricity. All right, so here's how we generate a sine wave. All right, so if you think about it, all right, uh, the Hoover Dam, right, that's out in the, outside of Las Vegas, Lake Mead, all right, the Colorado River feeds into Lake Mead, and then we back it all up, and then... Um, you know, Lake Mead, we open the floodgates, essentially, and we push these large turbines with water, all right? Uh, if you don't know which one I'm talking about, if you saw the movie Transformers, uh, it's in that one as well. That's the Hoover Dam, all right? But the, uh, as you push water through these gates, it causes the turbines to move, all right? And they try to control the water flow so that they generate clean electricity, okay? Uh, not percent, like, not environment clean, clean waveforms, all right? Uh, if they don't move these at a consistent rate, all right, the waveform for the electricity won't be clean and they have to do a lot more filtering of the signal uh, so that when it comes to you and I, they don't even, you know, electric companies don't even give you and I clean waveforms. Um, they kind of dirty them up a little bit so that your power varies and they can charge you more for your electricity, okay? But in essence, this is how we're creating the form. So the turbine moves and as the turbine moves at a certain speed all right we generate a magnetic field and that magnetic field gets electrons to flow okay so our conductor essentially is the turbine that the water is moving through so what's going to happen here is we have this waveform on the right so we're going to kind of step back and forth through it all right so as we go through here as it rotates around all right from north to south, it generates this waveform right here. All right, so if we look at point A, okay, point A is where we're gonna start, and we can see the flux fields from north to south. Does everybody kind of see those on the screen, all right? The flux fields are from north to south, and we are gonna generate our conductor. So I want you to think of a turbine, water pushing a turbine, and causing it to rotate. So as it rotates, we start at point A, okay, then we rotate to point B, all right? Where are we at point B? We're directly across from the North Pole, all right? And our waveform is at its highest point, all right? The amplitude. Then we're gonna rotate to point C, okay? Point C, we come back down to zero. Notice point A and point C are zero. And then we rotate to point D. So we're following the little red dot on the left-hand side and it's transforming over here to the waveform on the right-hand side, okay? So we're over here at point D now. We are at the south pole, which means we are at the negative maximum, right, of the amplitude. And then we complete the path, all right? So this is how it creates the oscillating waveform. It rotates around and around and around. So it's constantly going A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. And it's doing that a certain amount of times a second 
and creates the waveform. That's how we're generating a sinusoidal voltage and current. Okay, so we got to know some important pieces here, all right? Different pieces. The amplitude, okay, it's the maximum value of the voltage or current. So for this example, we're looking at the voltage, okay? This is the most voltage that we can get out of this waveform, okay? And we measure the amplitude from the zero point up to the highest point or the crest of the wave, okay? So in this point, this is the amplitude where I've shown you with A with the arrows. So the amplitude of this waveform is 20 volts. All right, 20 volts. So from the zero to the highest point. Because even if we look at the negative point, right, it goes from zero down to negative 20. So we don't really express it as, you know, 40 volts here. That's not how we would do 40 volts. It oscillates back and forth between 20 volts positive, 20 volts negative as those electrons flow back and forth. All right, so the period is important too. Period's gonna tie into frequency in a little bit. The period, but it, period is the time in seconds for it to complete one cycle. So this waveform that I have on the screen here, it's one cycle, all right? From where it starts at zero, goes up to a maximum, goes back down through zero, goes to a minimum, and then goes back up to zero. That's one complete cycle. So if we look at this graph here, for it to complete one cycle, the graph, time is the x-axis, time is in microseconds. So for us to complete one cycle here, it's 50 microseconds, all right? So that's the period. The period is in seconds, and we represent the period with a capital T, all right? So the period T, all right, it's a capital T because we're talking about time. We don't use little t for time in this case, but we use capital T because the period is amount of time um, and we don't want a P for phase or anything like that. So the capital T is the period and the period of this particular waveform is 50 microseconds. All right, so you should, you should make sure that you have all this in your notes, all right? This will come in handy on your lecture quiz and things like that. Make sure that we're drawing this out and we understand how this waveform uh, was generated. We can find the period of any sine waveform as long as we take it from where it starts to where it ends, anywhere across the waveform. All right, so we can do this in multi-sim when we do it. So generally, we like to go from zero to zero, okay? It's not always perfect when we look at our oscilloscope, and you'll see that towards the end of the chapter, uh, what I'm talking about there. But this is the period. This is the period, if we happen to take it between these two points. That, if we went from peak to peak or crest to crest, that would also be just as good as a period, all right? Just as good as anywhere. As long as you're taking from one point to its corresponding point on the other end, all right, and it completes the entire wave path, all right, you are taking the period. We could take it from um, trough to trough of the waveform. The trough is the lower part of the waveform. So we could do this anywhere across here, okay? Amplitude, same way, right? So what we really need to understand, okay, is just where to take that period. As long as you take it from where it starts and it completes its entire cycle to where it ends, you're fine with finding the period, okay? The period is important to find the frequency. The frequency is probably more common to you. It's the number of cycles a sine wave completes in one second, okay? So for us here in the United States, when we plug into the outlet in the wall, our frequency is at 60 hertz. So everything we do in the United States with our electricity and our power operates at 60 hertz. If you've been to Europe, you have to have a different plug. All right, why? Well, because they operate a little bit different voltage and their, fre their frequency is at 50 hertz. So it will destroy your stuff if you try to. So you have to convert back and forth between this, so it cleans up or amplifies the frequency for you so that your devices work. So that's why you have to have those special adapters uh, in foreign countries and things like that when you go. Uh, they operate a little bit differently with their electricity. So frequency is important. All right, frequency is measured in hertz. And let's take a look. If we have three cycles of a wave occur in one second, so remember frequency is the number of cycles a wave happens in a second okay so in this case we have three cycles of a wave in one second so it's represented by this waveform this waveform is oscillating oscillating means we're going back and forth 
evenly between highs and lows. We're not being dampened or anything like that. It's a, it's a sinusoidal waveform where it has a consistent period and a consistent amplitude. Means we're oscillating, means we're going back and forth, up and down, up and down, up and down, forever and ever and ever. So the frequency of this waveform is, all right, three hertz. Now, where else does this come into play? All right, think about your radio stations. All right, if you ever listen to AM radio, that's called amplitude modulation. That's why it's called AM radio, amplitude modulation. All right, so they impact the heights of the waveforms. That's where your radio signals are. And then your AM radio actually operates in hertz, okay? Hertz aren't as strong, right? So that's why AM radios just don't sound as good. They don't come in stereo. We can't put as much into them. If you listen to FM radio, you listen to frequency modulation. Okay, FM radio is in megahertz, which means there's a lot more cycles per second when you transmit that signal. That's what makes it stronger and why we can transmit in stereo. All right, so that is why FM sounds much better than AM. AM sounds like you're listening to it through like a cone. All right, and FM is in, you know, your, you know, surround sound stereo sounds really good, nice and clean. It's because it operates at much higher frequencies. So the higher the frequency, all right, the more stuff that we can pack in there and the more uh, cycles per second that you're going to be able to unpack and hear that. So it just, that's what makes it much more clear. So when you're listening to like <clears throat> the big 98 or something like that, right? I think that's there. It's like eight, um, 98.9, whatever megahertz. That's what it operates at. Okay. Or any one of your race radio stations. So on your dial, when you turned into like 1035 or something like that, all right? It's 103.5 megahertz. So you're using a combination of resistors, inductors, and capacitors, all right, to actually filter for that specific frequency, all right? And that's how you're receiving that signal, all right? Uh, satellite uses um, XM, um, so it's more microwaves, uh, not like the microwave in your house, but uh, when we're talking about microwaves, we're talking about these kind of waves we're looking at here. On um, we're transmitting very, very small waveforms, all right, that you can't see at very, 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 very high frequencies. Okay, so that's kind of how your microwave works too. The microwave oven in your house, all right. When it does that, all right, there's a there's a really large capacitor in there, and we have we operate generally at like a thousand watts. What we do in there is that's so that we can oscillate the water molecules that's really how your, your microwave works is it goes in and it makes the water molecules in your food vibrate and as they vibrate they heat up because they're creating friction and that's really how you're heating your food up so you can oscillate the water molecules at a specific frequency and that's what you're doing um, when you use your microwave and that sort of thing so that's kind of cool a lot of cool stuff that goes along with uh, frequency and that, all right, so if we have lower frequency signals, so like on the left-hand side, all right, notice the wavelengths are much slower, so think AM, and then we have higher frequency cycles, okay? So if we look at the one on the left, all right, there's two cycles per second, right? There, so that's operating at two hertz. If we look at the one on the right, all right, there's one, two, three, four cycles, so that one's operating at four hertz. So there's, it's twice as fast when it's operating. All right, the way we go back and forth between period and frequency, the reciprocals of one another. So to find the frequency, I take one divided by period. So one divided by T. T has to be in seconds. All right, so if you're reading something in milliseconds or microseconds, you need to convert that milliseconds or that microseconds to seconds. So frequency is one over the period. Okay, and then on the second equation, they're, they're reciprocals of each other. So period is also one over the frequency. So if I take, you know, one over 60 hertz, I'll get the period, if that makes sense, all right? So we'll do some examples here as we work through this. So right now we have a period, if it's 50 microseconds, okay, so if we know the period is 50 microseconds, we wanna find the frequency the frequency would be one over the period. So I'm gonna take one divided by 
50 microseconds and make sure I'm doing 50 times 10 to the minus 6, right? Because 10 to the minus 6 is micro. And I would put it in my calculator that way. Make sure I got parentheses. I get 20,000 hertz, or we call it what? 20 kilohertz. Okay, 20 kilohertz. So the, the going back and forth between period and frequency is relatively easy. All right, you just need to make sure that you're using seconds. You can also use the 1 over x button if you have some older calculators or the x inverse button on your calculator uh, as well. So you don't actually have to type in 1 over 50 times 10 to the minus 6. You can type in 50 times 10 to the minus 6 to the negative 1 power, and it still will give you the 20,000 that you're looking for. So just a little bit of a shortcut there in your calculator. So maybe pause the video, go through, uh, make sure you're plugging stuff in your calculator and you're getting the same answers that I have up here on the screen. All right, so we wanna find the instantaneous voltage. So we can find that anywhere on the curve, okay? We can find that anywhere along the curve as long as we know the specific time and as long as we know the, uh, the magnitude of the voltage or the current as well, right? The highest value. All right, so if we're looking at the magnitude on this graph, it would be 20 volts, right? That's the highest that this waveform gets. All right, so we always use what we call the peak value, okay? The peak voltage. It's the voltage from, it's the amplitude of the waveform, but we do call it the peak value for the voltage, okay? Amplitude and peak voltage value are the exact same thing, okay? So in this case, right, analyzing this, it's 20 volts. We have to come up with the right equation to apply here when we do this, okay? We can also take a look at peak to peak. Okay, so peak to peak is the 20 volts down to the negative 20 volts. So peak to peak means how far this waveform actually travels. So if it goes all the way to its highest point and all the way to its lowest point, it's really just twice whatever VP is, right? Uh, VP is 20 volts in this case, so 2 times 20 is 40, right? The distance from negative 20 to 20 is 40. That's really where that's coming from. So we call that VPP, okay? So positive peak to negative peak. We're just taking 2 times VP. We can do the exact same thing with current. All the examples I'm giving you are with voltage, but you can do the exact same thing with current, okay? Now, we are going to calculate the RMS value, the root mean square value. We use this because AC circuits and DC circuits give off the same amount of heat at the particular RMS value, okay? It's called the effective value. So that's where AC and DC equal one another as we're applying them, all right? That has to do with some basic trig. All right, uh, when we do this, the RMS value, uh, there's gonna be some different numbers here. So if we know what 0.707 is, it's the square root of two. Well, this comes through the unit circle and things that you should learn in your math class uh, when you do the trig stuff. I, I'm not gonna reteach you, you know, where the, um, the, the trig portion of this, that's not the important part, but I want you to understand the, the 0.707 comes from a tangent uh, of the waveform uh, and remember tangents opposite over adjacent and when we're doing that, but we, it ends up being uh, because we're at 45 degrees uh, We use a 1 1 square root of 2 triangle. All right, and that's where the 0 0.707 comes in Okay uh, To play as we get this value in okay, so All I want you to do is be able to calculate the RMS voltage. So you take 0 0.707 Okay times VP Okay 0.707 times VP. Same if I ask you to calculate the IRMS. Now, why do I need the IRMS and the VRMS? Later on, when we calculate power for a sine wave or a sinusoidal wave, we use the RMS values to calculate power with AC circuits. So it's imperative that you understand how to calculate our, um, RMS values. Literally, all you have to do is substitute in these values. Okay, you just have to use these two equations here. So know what your VP is times 0 0.707. Know what your IP is, all right? That's the highest current that you get, all right? So if this graph was in current, right, it would just be your, your peak current value, okay? So 0 0.707 times either one. 
All right. So if we wanted to find the VP given the RMS, so this is going back the other direction. Say I gave you the the RMS voltage for something, you would multiply by 1.41. Okay. So uh, same applies to the current piece. So just know these four equations here, um, and just be able to use them as I ask you uh, question-wise. So, but know that we're this is really dealing with a. a a 1 1 square to 2 triangle which is a 45 degree triangle and we're really looking at where we have issues of square root of 2 over 2 and square root of 2 uh, and where those apply as we go around the unit circle but that's where those values are developed but we will use all of the RMS values when we calculate power for a AC circuit okay so when we talked about peak to peak voltage I was just doing that before right uh, that was 2 times uh, VP right that was 40 volts in this case so the magnitude, okay, can be uh, for the RMS, all right, is 14.1. How did you get 14.1? Well, what did we do to 5VP? You had to take 0 0.707 times 20. 0 0.707 times 20 gives you the 14.1. That's the RMS voltage, all right? And then we can go back the other way. So you can take 14.1, uh, okay? times 1.41 and that'll get you back to 20 or if we want the voltage peak to peak all right I would just take double VP so 2.82 times the voltage RMS I'm not going to get too much into you know questioning guys at all on this but make sure that you have these different equations down um, I will expect you to be able to do uh, RMS voltage RMS current and calculate RMS power I'm not going to do a lot with the VPP or things like that, okay? But I do want you to know that we got to, for every AC circuit we solve, all right, if I give you VP, all right, the peak voltage, you should know that I got to go to RMS voltage to solve the circuit, okay, and to find power. So let's talk about different types of angular measurements, okay? You probably did this in math class. Uh, most likely if you take 1720 you're going to be taking this uh, as well and understanding all the differences here all right we got some important triangles that are on here all right notice uh, i talked about before the 45 degree angle here so it's a one one square to two triangle but essentially we need to be able to go back and forth between radians and degrees okay uh, what's a radian real quick a radian is the radius of a circle any circle if you take its radius and uh, you place that radius, like so if we had a string, we made a circle a certain size, let's say it had a radius of five, okay? And you cut a string, let's call it five inches long, okay, that's a radius. And you went around a circle that had a radius of five and around the circumference of the circle, you took that string and you laid it around the circumference, that's a radian, okay? So pi is the most common one that you've ever learned in math class, it's 3.14. And it, you know, it's irrational, it goes on forever. But technically, it's 3.14 radiuses, radii, that it takes to get halfway around a circle. And then 2 pi is 6.28. It approximately takes 6.28 radiuses of a circle to go all the way around the circle. So, right? So, we're taking the radius of that circle and putting it around its circumference, and that's where radians come into. Okay? So I don't, I don't expect you to know a ton about how we develop radians. Uh, we cover that in 1720, but I, I, you should know it from other math classes and things like that. Okay. But I, what I do want you to know is be able to go back and forth between uh, radians and degrees. Uh, very important for us to be able to do this because sometimes we transmit stuff in radians and, and every, not everything's in degrees. It's just two methods of kind of doing the same thing with circles. All right, um, but circles are kind of easier for us to work with in radians uh, than degrees i know that sounds kind of weird and backwards um, but it, but they are much more simplified it's kind of like uh, you know the greeks used uh, 3.14 they used pi when they did all their calculations where the egyptians they used 22 over 7. all right if you do 22 over 7 in your calculator it's about kind of the same approximation sort of thing okay so if we take a look at this uh what we really want to be able to do to go radians to degrees all right, we're going to multiply degrees by 180 over pi. So that's what's in yellow right there, the simplified version. We're going to take degrees times pi over 180. Pi over 180 times degrees. That's going to get us into radians. How do I know which one to have on top? Do I have pi or 180? 
if I want to end in radians, I always have pi on top of 180. If I want to end in degrees, I always want to have degrees over pi, so 180 over pi. So whichever form that you want to end in should be the fractional piece that's on top. All right, so if we want to find degrees, I'm going to take 180 degrees and divide it by pi. So hopefully that makes sense. We're going to do a couple examples here. So how many radians are in 45 degrees? All right, so we're going to take 45 we want to end up in radians, right? So that means I'm going to take 45 times pi over 180, all right? And that's going to give me 0.785 radians. Now, sometimes we leave it in fractional form, okay? So 45 goes into 180 four times. So another correct answer for this would be pi over 4, okay? So pi over 4 would be an acceptable answer uh, for this as well. So how many degrees are in 1.2 radians? All right, I want you to think, what is 1.2 radians? Well, it's 1.2 radiuses around the circle. So you gotta think of, I haven't even gone halfway around a circle yet, so I gotta make sure my answer makes sense. But I'm in radians and I wanna end up in degrees, so I have to multiply by 180 divided by pi when I do this problem, and I get 69 degrees. So I take 180 over pi in my calculator in parentheses and multiply by 1.2. What I want you guys to do, make sure you pause the video right now and get your calculator out and make sure that you're getting these numbers so that you know that you're putting it in your calculator correctly. If you're struggling with putting this in your calculator correctly and getting these results, uh, let me know. But you can either take, so like at the first one, you can either take 45 times pi, hit enter, and then divide it by 180, or you can put pi divided by 180 in parentheses and multiply that by 45 and hit enter. The same would work for the bottom problem uh, as well. So just whatever you're comfortable with, make sure that you understand how to enter that into your calculator uh, better. Okay, so here's how everything equates. The important, and you guys know this from the, if you took 1720 or maybe some Algebra 2 stuff, uh, the important angles on here, these are called the quadrantal angles. All right, 0, 90, 180, 270, 360s. Those are kind of essentially our north, south, east, and west parts on our Cartesian coordinate system when we do the graph. Now, radians relates the exact same way. So 90 is equivalent to pi over 2. 180 is equivalent to pi. 270 is equivalent to 3 pi over 2. And 360 is equivalent to 2 pi. So it's really just using two of the same systems, all right, to do the same thing. All right, we're going to talk about phase angles and leading and lagging current, all right? That's going to be specific points where the waveform is, all right, relative to zero. So we're going to talk about leading and lagging current and what a phase angle is and what phase moments are and phase measurements as we go through, okay? This is just showing you a relationship between radians and degrees as we go through it, all right? But when we talk about a phase shift, okay, this goes back into like, um, algebra, algebra two, where you guys took like a parabola and you shifted it left, right, up, down. You multiplied by a fraction or a whole number to make it, you know, really big or really skinny. Same kind of concept here when we shift waveforms. Okay, we shift that inside the trig argument. We're going to shift inside the trig argument for the sine wave. If we were outside the trig argument, our wave would go up or down. We want to shift the wave left or right, so it's going to be inside the argument. Remember, so if you had like, you know, sine of uh, theta plus 2 or sine of inside parentheses versus sine of theta close parentheses plus 2, that would shift it like up. So the phase shift, if we have a negative phase shift, all right, it's going to shift it right, okay? A sine shift that leads is shifted left, so we're going to have a positive phase shift. Okay, so what I want you to think about is in algebra, right, a parabola is x squared. Okay, if you had x minus 2 squared, it shifted the graph to the right. If you had x plus 2 in parentheses squared, it shifted the graph to the left. Same kind of concept here as we talk about phase shift. So for us, it's going to be V equals VP, all right, peak voltage, times sine of theta, whatever that angle is, right, uh, 45, 90, 180, 
or pi over two, pi over four, pi over six, pi over three, whatever that angle is, plus whatever phase shift we wanna do, shifting the current left or right, all right? Uh, just so you know, like if you studied sine and cosine waves, they are 90 degrees out of phase. They're, they're 90 degrees out of phase with each other. Cosine actually leads sine by 90 degrees. All right, so phi, okay, that's the one with the, uh, the, line, the slash through it. So this, this should hopefully help clear it out if we look at the relationships here. All right, I'm gonna start with the, uh, the graph on the left-hand side here. If we're taking a look at the two waveforms, there's a darker waveform labeled A, a lighter waveform labeled B, all right? So if we look at A, A is leading B by 90 degrees. How do we know that? Well, look where A and B both cross the x-axis, okay? The leading signal will always be the one closest to the y-axis or highest on the y-axis. It's gotta be closest and highest. If they're both close, okay, if they're both crossing the y-axis at the same time, like example two here, all right, then it's the highest one, okay, if that makes sense. So let's look at the first example here on the left. We can see that angle A is lead, or sorry, the signal A is leading signal B by 90 degrees. It's the closest one to the y-axis and we're looking at their values on the x-axis. All right, so hopefully we can visually see that A leads B by 90 or we can say that B is lagging A by 90. So we can reference it as a leading or a lagging signal. Okay, let's look at the second one here. Okay, notice they're both on the y-axis. Signal B and signal A are both on the y-axis. However, B is higher up on the y-axis when they're both at zero, so B is going to lead signal A by 90 degrees. This, what we have right here on the right-hand side, signal A is a sine wave, signal B is a cosine wave, okay? But if they were both sine waves, which they still can be, all right, we are saying that signal B leads signal A by 90 degrees, or we could say that signal A lags signal B by 90 degrees. Why is this important? Because when we start talking about three phase current, all right, some of you guys, you know, in industry, we have three phase motors. So what comes to your house is single phase. So you would be getting signal A, but a lot of motors, all right, or our big FANUC mo uh, robot that we got in class is a three-phase motor, all right? Our plasma table, three phase, all right? If we use three phases, there's a phase A, a phase B, and a phase C. So that's what three-phase electricity is. There's three voltages, okay, or three currents that are coming through, and they are all 120 degrees apart from one another. So when we're talking phases in electricity and electrical talk, there are there is single phase, which would be one of these, okay? And there is three phase, which would be three signals, A, B, and C. So what comes to like the school or what comes to your home is one leg of the three phase. So you would have signal A that comes down as like 240 volts and then we split that 240 volts into 120. That, there's no such thing as two phase. Um, some people call it two phase. It's really called split phase uh, when you do that. And it, it doesn't, two phase doesn't technically exist. There's single phase and there's three phase. And it's what we do with the, um, the uh, three phase or the single phase to get the other voltages we need. Okay, so like the dryer at your house, all right? you have a, a different plug for your dryer, okay? So, you know, what is that? Well, that's required to use 240, okay? So, are you using two phases there? No, you're using a single phase of 240 that's broke into two 120s that wires into that, okay? So, it's called split phase when we do that. It's not two phase, okay? Just so that you guys know. Okay, so we can break it into leading and lagging. Okay, so we're really just shifting. So here in this example, A 
Okay, A is leading signal B by 45 degrees. A is closest to the y-axis. This is the easiest way to remember this. A is closest to the y-axis in this case, and it's closer by 45 degrees than the B signal. You can pick it off anywhere, but it's always much more convenient to what's closest to the, the y-axis, okay? So if we look here, A is lagging B. They're both on the y-axis, but B is higher up on the y-axis, so it's leading, okay? So B is leading A by 30 degrees. So it's how far their distance is on the x-axis is what you're reading the lead or lag value. We're determining if they're leading or lagging by how close they are to the y-axis or how, if they're both on the y-axis, like in the second example, how high up the highest one is. That's the leading current or the leading voltage, okay? So this is talking about our phase shift. All right, so if we take a look, all right, the phase shift is phi. So if we write the voltage for this, okay, we have the two signals here, the one that's kind of a pinkish, maroonish sort of thing versus the blue one. So, okay, if we have a waveform that lags, the equation is going to be 30 volts or 30 sine of theta minus 45. We have to write the 45 because we're writing this equation based on the reference voltage. So if we're looking at the red or the pink or maroon, whatever you call, want to call this uh, graph here, look, its amplitude is 30 degrees. That's the highest that waveform gets. All right, so we're going to write that as 30 sine of theta. So theta is going to represent every possible angle that it can go through, whether it's you know 45, 90, 135, 180. We're going to calculate exact values for that. But when we're doing it in reference to the blue, we're going to say that it has been shifted, what? 45 degrees, okay? It's lagging A when we go through that, okay? So that's where the phase shift comes in. And since it's shifted to the right, we have a minus 45. If it was leading and shifted to the left, it would be a plus 45. But since it's lagging, it's gonna be a minus 45 on our signal. So in this case, this is where it's leading, okay? Same two waveforms, all right, but now we've shown where this one is leading, okay? Its amplitude is still 30, it's still sine of theta, but now it's plus 45 because it's leading the reference angle, not lagging. It's technically shifted left, so it's plus 45. So this is what I was talking about before when we were talking about uh, in algebra class where you did the parabola and you shifted the parabola, you had the parent function that was x squared and you shifted the parabola left or right. Same exact concept here with the sine wave. Okay, so we can see, all right, the plus means that we're shifted to the left. It, so remember the plus and minus is opposite in your head, all right? If it's a, if it's a plus 45, the waveform is shifted left. If it's a minus 45, the phase shift is to the right. How do you know that? Because the point is to get to zero. So in this particular case, a negative 45 for theta, negative 45 plus 45 gives me sine of zero, and I gotta be zero at zero uh, on that place. And that's, if we notice the waveform at negative 45, the waveform is going through an X value, okay? Or a Y value that is zero, okay? So, earlier I was talking about three phase, all right, just because I got ahead of myself a little bit there, but this is essentially where three phase is coming into play. There are three different sinusoidal signals that the utilities generate. And how do they do that in the generator? They have different poles, okay? So there's multiple poles inside that big generator. So when we step back and talk about at the Hoover Dam as the water goes through and turns, these generators are huge. They're huge, they're huge, they're huge. They're way bigger than our classroom. Um, I've been down there. You can take the, uh, the Hoover tour dam. I'll see if I can put some pictures up and show you guys. Uh, but you go down in there and there's eight different generators on the Arizona side and there's eight different generators on the Nevada side. So they got a total of 16 different generators uh, that are knocking out all this voltage. And it's where they place the magnets to get the three phase. Okay, they're the large magnetic fields uh, 
that they do that. So this is how they generate 120. It's where the poles are. And you'll understand that towards the end of the lecture where the poles are uh, when we're talking about that. But your main, now this doesn't come to your house. It's very rare if you have three phase coming into your household, okay? Okay, everything that you use in your house for the most part, other than like maybe your electric range and your dryer, <clears throat> only require 120 volts. So, uh, you know, unless you got welding equipment or things like that that you've had special uh, plugs and put it home, okay? Um, you know, and we use different breakers. So it's kind of a, a different, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But so for three phase, you know, in industry, when you're using a three phase motor, all right, we're using phase A, B, and C as it rotates around, and they're 120 degrees out of phase with one another. Okay, so that's really the important piece. Uh, so that's why you have three hot lines when you're when you're wiring up the motor and one neutral. Okay, so the number of wires is going to change when you're wiring up something three phase versus something that's 120. All right, so let's find that instantaneous voltage. I just wanted to brief you guys, you know, a little bit. We're not going to get you know really heavy into depth on three phase here, but I want you to understand where three phase is developed because, you know, when I'm in class, I'm talking about hey, the robot over here that's three phase voltage versus this robot's you know running on single phase. Um, so just those different kind of things there. All right, so instantaneous voltage for us, voltage, and we've seen this equation already a little bit, but we're actually gonna apply it now. So, all right, uh, voltage is VP sine theta. So this is how we calculate the voltage at any particular point along the sine wave. So I can give you different theta values, different angles, and we can calculate the exact instantaneous voltage at like 45 degrees or 60 degrees or 180 degrees uh, you, you should be able to calculate it anywhere based on whatever that peak value is. All right, so we have to use VP. All right, so that's going to be, that's the amplitude of our waveform. So that's what's going to go in the front of our equation when we do these calculations. And we have to use theta. We have to know what angle we're talking about. So let's do an example here. I have, if the peak voltage is 25 volts, the instantaneous voltage at 50 degrees is. And this would be a problem that I'd give you on, you know, a quiz or a test or um, you know, your final or things like that, all right? What do we have? We have VP, VP is 25, and we have theta, theta is 50. We literally just need to substitute into that equation here, all right? The biggest, most important part for you is making sure that your calculator, in this case, is in degree mode, in degrees mode. So hit mode on your calculator, go down, put it to degrees, hit enter, make sure degrees is highlighted or shaded on your calculator. If you have it in radians mode, you will get the wrong answer. So make sure you're, you can pause the video and get the exact value that you need to that I have on the screen here um, so that your calculator is in the right mode and that you're doing it correctly. So when we plug this in, you should just hit 25, sign 50, close parentheses, you should get 19.2 volts. So what does that mean? When we are at 50 degrees on that sine waveform, we're at 19 volt, 19.2 volts at that time. So that's why when you're reading AC voltage, all right, it's gonna change up and down on your meter sometimes because it's oscillating. It's not a constant voltage. DC voltage should be a constant voltage. AC is not going to be, it's alternating, okay? So let's take a look at this, all right? We're gonna calculate at these different angles here, and I wanna show you where they're at. So the first thing you should do, right, make sure you write all this down in your notes, okay? Draw this waveform exactly as you see it. So at 40, at minus 40, things like that. So we should know, if we look at this waveform, its amplitude is 40 volts. The peak value is 40, the amplitude of this waveform is 40. We're going to use the previous equation, V equals VP sine of theta. And we're going to use 45, 125, 180, and 220, and 325 for theta, okay? So that you can see where these voltages actually are on this waveform. But remember, this waveform is moving really fast in, in the real world. When you're out and you're operating a motor at using three-phase voltage, you're not going to watch it rotate. I mean, it's going to be, you know, like 2,000 RPMs, revolutions per minute and things like that, right? So it's not like you can slow it down really good and see the waveform. Now, if you have an oscilloscope that monitors it, you can change different values, and we're going to learn how to do that towards uh, the end of the lecture um, so that you can see the waveform better and what's occurring. All right, but to the naked eye, you're not going to be able to see anything. 
All right, so we're going to substitute into the equation here. All right, so the first one, all right, 40 sine of 45 degrees. We get 28.28 volts. And I've drawn an arrow. That's approximately where we are on the sine wave. We're 45 degrees in on the x value. Our voltage at 45 degrees is 28.28. And remember, this voltage is being generated, all right, from something rotating in a circular motion, okay, like we saw at the very beginning of the lecture. So this one's the 40 sine of 125, okay, we're approximately, I tried to get the arrow there as exact as I could, we're 32.76 volts. Here, 40 sine of 180, we're back down to zero volts, we're going the other direction now. So here it's 40 sine of 220, so this is where it lies. So remember, everything that's the argument, you hear me say the argument of the trig value, the argument is what is in the parentheses. So the 45 is the argument, the 125 is the argument, sine, the 180 is the argument, the 220 is the argument. That's our theta value, and that's the specific angle we're looking at. And the last one, 325, is here. And then we return, we go back to 360, and we start all over. And that's what's great about the sine wave stuff is it oscillates over and over and over and over. And like I said earlier, this is why we use it in transmission lines. We can send this much longer distances, much longer distances. But I wanted to give you a view here, you know, what, what's going on on this waveform and, and where we exactly are as we go through the different phase angles on here, okay? So, uh, you know, the phase vector, here's, here's what I wanted you to see. All right, so if I step back real quick, let's take the voltages and how they're calculated and as we go through everything, um, I want you to imagine in your mind, all right, let's step back, we're at Hoover Dam again and we have a generator and we wanna generate electricity. This is exactly what's going on, okay? So what's on the left-hand side, that circle, right? And that's what we're flooding with water and we're pushing that in a circular motion, all right? And we're capturing the field that's generated by the water turning that turbine. So as we're doing it, okay, and we go through here, it starts at zero and it rotates around in a circular manner. And this is where the voltage is developed, all right? And it's doing this very fast and it's doing this at a specific speed, all right? So they control how much water is being flown in, like flowed through that turbine so that we can do this process over and over and over. So if I back it up again, okay? Just imagine this, this is happening over and over and over, nonstop. You're just generating electricity and you're creating this sine wave because of the magnetic field, right? We're getting electrons to flow and we're getting them to flow at a specific speed, okay? And a specific voltage and current that we want, a constant rate. So that's really how we're generating I mean, this is an AC circuit, but this is really how we're generating electricity. Uh, the alternator in your car does the same thing. Your alternator is generating AC, all right? And then we convert your car uh, to DC because everything runs off the battery in DC in your car. So your alternator is literally just there to generate electricity as you're driving uh, to keep your battery charged. That's really the whole purpose of it, okay? And here's what's going on. As we go around the circle over and over and over, all right? And you can see how the two dots are tied together based on the phase angle and where we're located on the circle, all right? This is how we generate electricity. So think of water going into the turbine from the dam, okay, pushing the turbine in this circular motion, and this circular motion, all right, is creating uh, electron flow, which is creating our voltage and our current as it goes around and around and around the circle. Obviously it moves faster than this, but this is for you to see. Now, there'll be another part of those where there's different magnets that are wired up to catch a different phase. So this might only hit, right, every 120 degrees to create this phase, and then the other phase will be 120 degrees off of that phase, all right? So they have it set up so that you're generating three phase electricity. All right, so that's why you have the separate wires on your transmission line for your different phases of electricity that are being generated. So, but this in general, I mean, we, we do this over and over and over and over to create these signals. It's really a circular pattern that we create. Now, what I want you to imagine while we're still looking at this is later on, 
When we start talking about your alternator or an induction motor or things like that, what I want you to look at, at look at the position on this graph of 0000. zero, zero, zero. That's the middle piece, okay? That's like the rotor of our motor. The dashed circle, circumference, I want you to think of that as the stator. The stator, the outside of the piece. So we got the rotor and we got the stator and how these two kind of relate to one another and how the fields are generated and what we're changing. So think of everything as that. So <clears throat> the middle piece, right, the center of that circle, that's your rotor, okay? And the outside is your stator. Okay, we're going to talk about the induction motor and things like that in a little bit. I want you to remember those terms as we come back to this. This is, or come back to this slide. This is a really good slide to see how that waveform is generated. All right, so we can read the sine wave, okay, on an oscilloscope, and we're going to talk about it. So anytime we have a, um, a voltage that's a sinusoidal signal, we produce a sinusoidal current. A, an AC voltage is not going to produce a DC current, okay, it just can't. So if we have a sinusoidal voltage, an AC voltage, we have an AC current. Everything works the same that we calculated with DC. All the, there's nothing special. The calculations will all be the same. So we still read a voltage drop across a component. The current through a series circuit will still be the same, and we'll have different voltage drops across each resistor back. Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law will still apply to AC and DC voltage not, or to uh, uh, series and parallel circuits. Nothing will change. All right, but like I said before, we're, why do we use the RMS values? And why did we calculate RMS current and RMS voltage earlier? Because we have to calculate power and we always calculate power in AC circuits using the RMS current and the RMS voltage. Because remember, that's where AC and DC give off the same amount of power. So we want to make sure that all of our calculations are the same. So make sure that you have these power formulas uh, in your notes. Are they new? Absolutely not. This is Watt's Law, all three versions. Power is VI, power is V squared over R, and power equals I squared R. They are the exact same equations that we have been working with. So I'm not going to get too much into depth with this. All you need to do is... <clears throat> excuse me, remember how to get the VRMS and the IRMS, right? So we need that 0 0.707 times VP. That's the only difference. That's like just one more step, all right? Other than that, these are all Watt's Law, all Watt's Law. It's just where AC and DC give off the same amount of power. So on top, if we had a DC versus on bottom, if we had something that was AC. So let's do an example here. We have a sine wave has a peak value of 40 volts and we have a 100 ohm resistive load, what's the power dissipated? All right, so we have to find RMS first, right? So remember to find RMS, it's 0 0.707 times VP. So for this one, our voltage RMS is 28.3, then we have to apply the correct Watt's law. The correct Watt's, Watt's law for this one, based on what we're given, is V squared over R, but it's V RMS squared over R. Okay, so when we calculate that, it's 28.3. Uh, squared divided by 100 so the squared make sure you square 28 28.3 squared hit enter divide by 100 you should get about 8 watts okay all right so let's go back all right we've talked about this let's break it down what's going on so this is an AC generator so everything that I've talked about with the um, the turbines and things like that in the Hoover Dam and doing that sort of thing all right same thing here, all right? When you have the, uh, the, the alternator in your vehicle, this is what's going on, okay? We have a magnet in your stator. The stator's the outside. So remember when I started talking to you about your, uh, the circle a few slides ago, when I said the middle would be the rotor or the armature, okay? And the outside is the stator. So notice here we have permanent magnets in the stator and we have a rotational piece, the armature in the middle. All right, so the water would rush in, not into this portion, but it would rush and there would be a mechanical piece underneath that forces the armature to rotate in a circular motion, okay? As we rotate that armature, all those wires, and they go back and forth between the different poles. When I'm talking poles, I'm talking north and south. 
We're forcing electron flow through that wire. Okay, so how do we actually capture the AC voltage and current? We use the slip rings. Okay, so notice that there's slip rings that are sitting on the armature here. And those slip rings are attached to the brushes. Okay, so remember an AC uses slip rings, DC uses uh, brushes and a commutator. Okay, DC uses a commutator. AC uses slip rings. Slightly very different in variation. Okay, but this concept is still the same. All right, we're using the magnetic field. The magnetic field generated as we rotate the wire. Because remember, we talked about that in the magnetic field. We used the left hand rule. You put your thumb in the direction of the current and you wrapped your fingers in the field. The field would generate current in a specific direction. So as this rotates, right, remember, as the wires are orientated a certain way towards north, we're getting our positive part of our AC signal. And as they rotate towards the south, we get our negative magnitude. Okay, so and that's happening over and over and over and over. Okay, now those armature loops that we see, this only shows one loop, but if you've ever opened up a, an alternator or something like that, um, you, you, there's a bunch of windings. It's not just one wire. There's a bunch of windings, all right, that are on a magnetic core. Okay, so this is only shown one loop. There is a ton of loops uh, if you've ever opened up a, an alternator or something like that. All right. Now, there is some guy uh, somewhere that lives off the grid that has an alternator that runs an alternator that runs his house and doesn't pay for any electricity. I don't, I don't know how he keeps them all going all the time. It's a kind of a cool project. I've had a student kind of show me it before. Um, I haven't stepped into it too much, but you can look at that uh, online as well. He generates all of his own electricity, but he's somewhere in the mountains and gets snow, so I don't really know how he makes that happen all the time uh, in the wintertime and things like that. But very cool stuff all right so this is the dc that i was talking about okay where the, you had the commutator and the brushes this is really kind of the only difference um there's still a mechanical input so for us when we're generating okay you have your timing belt on your alternator so in your car the timing belt is what the mechanical input is that's on the armature that makes the armature on your alternator move so when we're talking the hoover dam all right there's a mechanical input that sits below those turbines but the water pushes that mechanical lever. So there's like impellers underneath there or propellers, whatever you want to call them. It actually, the, as the water flows through, and it's really crazy when you go down there, um, the tubes, the, the tunnels for the water are just huge. And you can stand like down underneath and you can actually feel kind of the, the water flow and shake you a little bit as it's being fed into the turbines. Uh, very, very, very cool. But they got that water flowing at a current uh, at a specific rate so that it turns that armature at a specific speed uh, to generate the electricity that we need. Very, very cool stuff uh, when we do that. Okay? But I mean, essentially, th this is what's going on, all right? Whether it's your alternator, okay? Or whether it's just a generator, right? Like we talked about with the Hoover Dam. So um, the left hand side here, where you see the slip rings and the brushes and where we're grabbing everything, okay? The, so underneath like the north and south poles on the right, that would where, be where our mechanical mechanism is that's turning it. So the, the timing belt in your car, okay, or the water we're talking about with the Hoover Dam that's pushing that and making it turn. So this is really how we're generating, you know, AC um, voltage and current as we go through here. All right, and we can, we can increase the number of poles, okay. So as we do this, we're going to increase... Uh, you know how much we can do so right here there's four poles each like there's a north pole a south pole north pole south pole all right so there's two of each but we we generate we call them each kind of one pole and we can calculate how the frequency works based on the number of poles divided by 120 120 is the voltage we're trying to generate so this is how we can generate a specific frequency uh, from an ac generator it's based on how many poles. So you can have a whole bunch of poles, you can have two poles, uh, those sort of things. It's just going to affect the frequency. So NS, N is the number of poles. S is the revolutions per minute, how fast that armature is rotating. Okay, and then we're going to generate a specific frequency. The 120 is the, the voltage. Or, okay, so we have one, two, three, four poles. All right, so it's going to be four 
times whatever speed that we're generating divided by 120. But if we take a look, this is how an, a, your generator looks kind of, or your, not your generator, well, it's a generator, yes, but your alternator in your car looks, okay? So there, there's four different main pieces here. There's the housing, right, that it sits in. There's the stator coils, okay? And then we have the rotor. So we can see what's going on with the rotor, all right? And then on the, on the opposite side of the housing is where your timing belt goes and connects and, and spins the rotor. Okay, and then you can see as the rotor turns, it affects the, the fields and the, the coils have an impact on them. And then what's the diode plate do? Okay, the diode is where we're, we're rectifying that signal there and we're going from AC. Remember your alternator creates AC. The diode plate rectifies the signal and makes it DC and then goes to your car battery. So remember diodes, are uh, electrical components that only allow current to flow in one direction so we use that to rectify the signal and we cover that uh, a little bit later on in another lecture okay so why do we produce it ac is more efficient to produce and easier to regulate we can clean those um those signals up and then we can convert it to dc using the diodes and rectify all right so just know uh there's slip rings and things like that uh, this is kind of what a cutaway looks like of an alternator and uh, you know you can kind of see what, what's going on there and you can see the windings on the stator coils you can see the rotor and what all it looks like okay so when we talk about AC motors there's going to be two major classifications all right so those two classifications are called the induction motor uh, that's the most common motor in the industry the induction motor that was developed by uh, Nikola Tesla all right, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the synchronous motor. Okay, so the, those are the main two um, types of AC motors that we'll talk about. We're going to talk about them in the mechanical class as well, or some of you might have already taken mechanical class or talked about that in mechanical class. All right, and then we'll touch on it again uh, in, in motor control. All right, so by, by all three of those courses, um, this one's more of a, a brush upon it, but you get a little bit more in depth than the other one. All right, so both of these, okay, we talk about a rotating field in the stator windings. Remember, the stator is the outside piece. It's the non-rotational piece, the non-mechanically rotating piece. It's not um, the the rotor or any of the armature of that. It's not the it's not the physically moving piece, but it is the piece that moves the field. So what we do is we rotate the field in the stator windings, the stator windings, and all. I'll show you guys uh, one of those in class, okay? So what we're doing with the induction motor, okay, is we are inducing a magnetic field onto the rotor, all right? So all those windings in the stator, we're sending alternating current and voltage. So right now we're, we're, we're stepping away from generating AC to using AC now. So we're using AC in the motor, okay? So what we do is we send those phases in whether it's three phase or single phase, we send those into the stator, all right? And the way it's wound, it changes, the, it winds back and forth, so we're changing polarity on the field. The field is going to change back and forth. And then we induce the magnetic field on the rotor, causing the rotor to turn, okay? And that's how we make our AC motors, very most common one in the industry, okay? So that's the induction motor. The synchronous motor is a little bit different because we have like the magnets on the rotor and what we do is we're not inducing now. It's synchronous because the rotor is trying to keep up with the stator field. So the rotor is essentially, we, we send the current through the stator field, remember the outside, the physically non-moving part, so that it the rotor on the inside tries to keep up, hence synchronous. It tries, the rotor tries to stay in sync with the stator. So the rotor is constantly changing um, and it's chasing the stator field. So that's really the difference between the two. All right, the induction motor, we're using the stator windings to force a magnetic field to turn the rotor versus the synchronous motor where the synchronous motor the rotor is trying to keep up with the stator field. Okay, it's chasing it uh, based on the fact of how the magnet set when we originally start on the inside. 
And this is kind of really what we're looking at here, okay? So on the inside, this would be like a three-phase induction motor. So where we wind, it, it's very, very important how we wind everything up. And I know, like, the, the talk about two-phase here. Um, and just remember, two-phase, it doesn't really exist as a phase two. It's how we use uh, different uh, windings from, like, a split phase from a 240, okay? A two phase or phase two, however they talk about, it's a split phase. We take a single phase, which is 240, and split it into two 120s, like the dry or your house. It's completely different from a three phase. Three phase is literally three separate phases, okay? So, but this is kind of what it looks like as we generate. So you can see the different signal here that are generated from the motor off the different phases. So with this, okay, this particular example, I want you to see it is, the first graph is the first phase on this, all right? So phase A, that's the first graph. Phase B is phase two here. And phase three, okay, is the, uh, the greenish kind of teal one. So this is a three-phase motor, okay, as we wind things through here. So we have phase A, phase B, phase C. How far apart are these phases? 120 degrees apart. So this is how we do a three-phase induction motor on the inside. It's based on where those windings are and we use that to push through. Why do we use three-phase? We can get much more torque. Okay, A lot of the motors in industry need a lot more torque than what a one-phase motor can do. All right, So it affects our horsepower and things like that. Here's what's going on. Okay, So this is rotating the stator field. Okay, so outside where the arrows are pointing, you can kind of see a faint little color change around the outside. So as we rotate the field in the stator, that's really what's going on on the inside. Okay, so this is an induction motor. It's got a squirrel. They're known as squirrel cage rotors. Okay, but it has aluminum conductors on the inside and it has a ferromagnetic material on the inside as well. Remember, ferromagnetic means it includes iron. Okay, something that's ferrous. So here's one that's kind of, you know, stripped away as we take a look at it. And here's what's really kind of going on as it's inducing the magnetic field. So remember the stator windings, those are the ones on the outside. That's the red, blue, red, blue on the outside. Okay, it's inducing a magnetic field on that core, forcing the core to rotate around. Okay, where the induction motor is constantly trying to keep up with the stator piece here. So this is more of an induction motor on the left-hand side. That's the armature or the, the rotor portion of the induction motor, okay? Versus the synchronous motor over here, okay, on the right hand side. All right, so let's start identifying, and I'm gonna do another video <clears throat> that breaks this stuff down a little bit for you as well, uh, where I'm using multi-SIM and an oscilloscope, and you can actually kinda see where we're getting uh, certain values here. But these are pulse waves, okay? So notice that these are square waves. Uh, these are digital waves based on how they're drawn right here. All right, but there's some important things, okay? There's the amplitude of the waveform, and then what we have is a leading edge, which we technically call the rising edge, and then we have a falling edge. And when these are pulse waves, this is instantaneous, all right? So it goes from zero to five, or from five to zero, or from zero to 24, or 24 to zero, when we're on the 870 trainer, all right, taking those kind of readings. This is those kind of waves, because this is DC right here. So we have a pulse width, that's time high, how long that signal is high, okay? The amplitude's gonna be our voltage here. All right, so those are with pulse waves. So other things that are important, all right? Okay, it has TW, but that's really time high, and then when it's down, we have time low, okay? So, and then we have the period. T is the period, okay? The TW, that's the pulse width, all right? But we like to call that time high and time low because that impacts our duty cycle, okay? And uh, to, duty cycle is time high over the period, so that's how you calculate duty cycle. We'll look at that here in a second. But just the, the different ways. TW is really, uh, it's the pulse width, but we're really talking about the, the time that the signal is high versus the time the signal uh, is low. And I really want you to make sure that, uh, most time I'm gonna have you ever calculate as a duty cycle, so you just need to know that you have to take TW here over T, or if I give you time high, it's the same thing as TW over T to get the duty cycle. You're gonna multiply that by 100 because duty cycle is always in 100%, okay? So to calculate duty cycle of a waveform, 
the total time that it's high or the pulse width divided by the period multiplied by 100 it's going to be a percentage okay so v average is just duty cycle times the amplitude okay duty cycle times the amplitude all right different kind of waveforms that we're going to look at we're not going to do too much with these ones i'm going to do more uh, of an ac waveform with you and a dc waveform with you um, on your test uh, those of you guys that have already taken digital electronics with me all right, you know that this is this should be a review for you and it should all come back to you slightly here so shortly all right but uh, so we have what ramp waves where uh, the slope calculation that you do it's just voltage over time so the voltage ramps up or ramps down so we have a positive ramp negative ramp voltage okay they're all linear how when we do this and sometimes it helps if we have you know triangular waveforms okay triangular waveforms or we have sawtooth waveforms okay just different waveforms that we look at uh, where we just we ramp up and stop ramp up and stop ramp up and stop so just think about different things on production okay how do we read these waveforms okay an oscilloscope so in class um, we're not going to do much with the actual physical oscilloscope okay but because uh, I don't really have a good function generator for us to take a look at but we're going to do it in multi-sim so on the computer uh, I'll go through and there'll be a slight lecture added on to this one uh, so that goes through multi-sim and how to read the uh, the oscilloscope from there uh, we will do a couple problems on the rest of this lecture but it'll make more sense uh, how to analyze a signal when you look at the uh, the multi-sim uh, lecture piece on this okay so what's an oscilloscope though we're really being able to read the electrical signal so I could plug this in the wall and see what the uh, AC voltage looks like okay we can analyze different signals here uh, we know the voltage piece we can or current if it's for, if we're reading the current instead all right so we can get many different important things off of here we can get the period we can get the, get the frequency we can get the voltage all right all those different sort of things so we'll do a couple examples i know that this one might be hard to see and then i'm going to do a separate lecture uh that'll have multi-sim where i'm going to pull up kind of a live uh, oscilloscope of some signals that i'm just generating for you guys to take a look at here there's two important pieces here that you have to read off of this drawing that's hard to see uh, i don't have a pointer for this one um, but we'll talk about it a little bit in lecture in, in on the board in class as well all right, but these little boxes. So I'm looking at the, the very, there's four different graphs here. I'm looking at the upper left-hand graph, all right, that's just two waves, a, a high wave and then a low wave. So it's just one period of a signal. So, and it says two milliseconds there. I'm looking at that one. All right, the two important things. It says channel one, right, is 0 0.5 volts. What that means, that's the height of one little square that you see on the screen there. The two milliseconds, that's the X dimension on one of those little boxes. Once we know that, we're going to use the little boxes on the screen there to determine how high that waveform is and its period. Okay, so it's very important. So if each one of those little squares is 0 0.5 volts high and this waveform is one, two, three boxes high, what's the voltage? It should be 1.5 volts. Does that make sense? All right, now let's find the period. Okay, the period should be, how many boxes does it take to complete one cycle? For this graph, it's all of the boxes across. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's 10 boxes for this to complete one cycle. Each box on the screen is, says that it's two milliseconds. I'm just reading off of the two milliseconds right there. So, for it to do one period, it's 10 boxes, each box is 2 milliseconds, it's a total of 20 milliseconds for it to do one period. All right, and then the frequency is 1 over the period, so 1 divided by 2 times 10 to the minus 3. All right, so we should be able to get all of these values here. The period's 20 milliseconds, the VP or the voltage, all right, is 1.5. Those are all based on the box. All right, VPP is just uh, VP times two, so 1.5 times two is three. And then the RMS voltage, right, we had to multiply uh, 1.5 times 0 0.707 to get the RMS voltage. All right, let's look at the graph immediately to the right. All right, it's got the, the two uh, positive humps on it, okay? First thing I do is I analyze 
the box values. So I know that each one of those squares is 500 millivolts high. So 500 millivolts. So if I were to count how high the waveform is, it's one, two boxes. It looks like it's about two and a half boxes high. Okay, so if I was just approximating this, I would say that it's uh, one, two, two and a half boxes high. So probably about, you know, 1250 millivolts high, if I were just to approximate. And then each box width is 0 0.5 milliseconds. Well, I got to calculate how many boxes does it take to make a period? So I'm going to start all the way on the left hand side and stop when I get to where it starts over again. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six boxes. It takes six boxes for one period. Each box is, three, is 0.5 milliseconds. So 0.5 times six is three milliseconds. So I now know the period is three milliseconds. So what did we calculate? T is three milliseconds. The peak voltage is 1250 millivolts. So then I take that times two to get VPP. And then RMS is 0 0.707 times 1250. So hopefully you guys can read this. All right, let's do the bottom left hand one together. This one's a little tricky. You only see how much of the waveform here? One of the waveform. You're missing the entire negative dip. So just be careful when you calculate the period on this one. All right, so let's analyze the boxes here. Each box is six volts high, and the top of this waveform takes one, two, three, and not quite a half, all right? So I would say that it's like 3.4 you know, or something like that boxes. So we're looking six times three is 18, and then it's not quite another six, probably like a two. So let's say like, let's approximate 18.2 volts. I don't remember what's gonna pop up on the screen here for the actual one. But let's say that it's a, um, it's 20.2 volts or 20, let's call it 20 volts, 20 volts-ish, okay? So we got 18 and then let's say that that little chunk uh, is about two volts. So we're gonna call that 20 volts high. And then it's 10, it's 10 a high or 10 across, it's 10 squ squares across for half the period. So I gotta get the whole period. The whole period is 20, uh, 20 squares because we're missing that down depth. So you're gonna take 20 times 300, okay? So you're gonna get 20 times 300. So that's 6,000 microseconds is the period, which is six milliseconds, okay? The VP, uh, we said 20, 20 I would have accepted on a test if it was handwritten, all right? Uh, 20.4 is probably the more exact value on here, and then VPP is 20.4 times two, and then the RMS is 0 0.707 times 20.4. Let's look at the last waveform in the bottom right-hand corner, okay? Taking a look at that, each box is 12 volts high, so each one of these waveforms is two boxes high. So we know that this waveform, the VP has to be 24 volts. Let's find the period. Uh, the best way for me, I'm just gonna start at zero and see where it starts over. It looks like it's two boxes to complete one period. Each box is 15 microseconds. So it's 30 microseconds to complete the period. All right, so this is 24 volts by 30 microseconds uh, for the period. So VP is 24 and then VPP is 24 times 2 and then the RMS is 0 0.707 times 24 volts. So that's a way to analyze it. I'm going to have one more video for you to watch. I'm not going to attach it to the end of this one. There'll be a separate one uh, just doing signal analysis uh, that you guys will watch. It might be two or three small chunks. I kind of break them up a little bit so that you can watch them. Uh, digital electronics we've watched these ones before that I've made, but uh, I think it'll really help you kind of clear up and you'll see like the working oscilloscope and how it works in multi-SIM uh, as well on this one. So that's signal analysis, understanding how to look at a waveform and calculate everything. Okay, so this is the end of the chapter. So just like all the other chapters, I expect you to know all these key terms. Remember they're at the end of the chapter in your book. Uh, remember to make sure that you're taking notes on all of these. And I'll scroll through them so that you can pause the video and write them down if you don't want to go through the book. But remember, you need the book to do the reading uh, homework assignment, okay? But you should know sine wave, alternating current, period, frequency, hertz, instantaneous values, and the equation, how we calculate them, what peak to peak were, RMS, okay? Uh, things like that. And why we used RMS. Remember, you have to put in RMS to calculate uh, the power. So you got to put your current and your voltage into RMS 
uh, to calculate the power. All right, a uh, couple quick things just want to remember. Right in North America, the frequency of an AC utility is 60 hertz. What's the period? Remember, period is one divided by frequency. So one divided by 60 is 16.7 milliseconds. So that one would be B. We'll just go through a couple of these here. Uh, the amplitude of the sine wave is measured what? If you look, you can't do, you know, anywhere on the wavelength there, but it's at the maximum point. So from zero up to the maximum, all right, that's the amplitude of the waveform. The time base of an oscilloscope is determined by the setting of what? The horizontal controls, okay? Time is on the x-axis. So when we were analyzing the boxes there, we were looking at the time of the boxes in like milliseconds and microseconds uh, in the two examples. Okay, so a sawtooth waveform, okay? Those are the two ramps, okay? One much longer than the other, okay? As it, so it literally looked kind of like a saw blade, and that's why it's called a sawtooth waveform. All right, so for the waveform shown below, the same power would be delivered to load with a DC voltage of what? So what should you be thinking here? Uh, where's AC and DC equal to each other? ERMS, so you should be going um, 60 volts times 0 0.707 and getting the 42.4 volts. All right, we'll do one more here. It says uh, a control on the oscilloscope that allows you to set the desired number of cycles of a wave on the display is this isn't one really I talked about too much but that's the time per division so uh, I'll cover that in another lecture how we change the X and Y uh, values on there but it's time per division okay on this so end of the chapter here uh, hopefully we learned a lot about AC you know generating where a signal comes from all those different things uh, very very important in a lot of different technology that we use and do um, we do transmit uh, you know it's, it's an AC signal, but it's an analog signal uh, as well when we transmit that. So very, very important when we start talking about A to D converters, D to A converters, uh, things like that. So this is it uh, for Chapter 8. We're starting to wind down. We only got a couple more chapters left uh, in this. And like I said, if you have any questions, email me. Ask them in class. All right. We'll do some labs on, uh, on multi-SIM with this, uh, seeing if we can analyze signals and do that sort of thing. Else, guys, have a great day. I will see you soon.